In this video, what we're going to be going through is the thoughts and principles behind a genomic DNA extraction. Um, I'm going to take you through a genomic extraction that we in the IMBM use quite a lot, um, and it's designed primarily for working on sponges. So you have your sample. Um, I do apologize for my terrible handwriting. Now, the idea is that this sample is packed full of bacteria. So you have your, your rods, your cocci, um, your vibraceae, um, and you also have your filamentous bacteria. Um, these are all living within here and make up approximately 40% of the biomass. And this is the DNA that we really want. So there's two ways of actually accessing this. The first way is to crush it and separate. So you basically um, put in a blender. So you have your blender with the whiz at the bottom. And from this, you then do a DNA extraction. Or the other way is to go for the direct extraction. So that's your blender. Um, with this method, you um, basically you freeze with liquid nitrogen. So it's a liquid nitrogen, and that is at minus 196 degrees Celsius. Um, which is approximately 77 Kelvin, uh, if, I'm, if I can do my maths right. Um, and you freeze it with this uh, and you crush. So you crush in um, a pestle and mortar, really, really fine powder. This um, powder is then added to a lysis buffer. Um, and this is the important, really important bit. So, in your lysis buffer, you need to have a number of chemicals. Um, now, we have found that um, a two-step lysis is best. So, the first step is simply a C-tab plus 1.4 molar um, sodium chloride. Okay. Now, this is to remove the polysaccharide so it removes your polysaccharides um, this is quite important because polysaccharides end up being our major contaminant in a sponge sample we also use um, TRIS at 50 millimolar um, the idea behind the TRIS is that it basically keeps the pH um, at 8.0. Uh, the reason for keeping it at 8.0 is that's the pH where DNA is most likely to be soluble. Um, so it's, it's all about the chemistry of DNA there. Um, we also use EDTA. Now this is a chelating agent and basically blocks D, sorry, D, DNAs. Um, so it basically blocks the DNA's activity. And that's very important because each one of the cells that you open up will have some DNAs in it. And if we allow it to be active during the lysis, then it, the possibility is that it's going to be completely destroying any DNA in there. Um, we also use lysozyme. Now lysozyme is a protein that actually breaks into the uh, peptidoglycan. So it breaks down the bacterial cell walls. Um, and the idea being, uh, so grab another pen, so you have your bacteria, make it look like a bacillus, um, with a nice thick cell wall around it. Now lysozyme actually comes in and attacks, so it's a, an enzyme, comes in and attacks this. 
So you end up with a cell that now looks like this, which has holes, nice big holes in the um, peptidoglycan. Um, this is really good because it allows the DNA to come out in the next step. So when you're doing this lysis, you want to be working at about 37 degrees C. Um, the reason being that is where lysozyme is most active. So the next step is um, the, from lysis is to add the proteinase K. So proteinase K, um, it's another protein, uh, but it's a much more robust protein than any of the others uh, that we're adding because, well, not because, it's um, just very robust. And this protein can work in the presence of SDS, so that's sodium dodecal sulfate. Um, SDS is a horrible chemical. Um, if you get it on your hands, it's, it's used for stripping engines, it's used in a lot of um, skin care products. It's really um, a nasty, nasty chemical, but it's great at lysing cells and basically um, chelating and not chelating, um, really binding and denaturing proteins. So it's all about um, lysis and protein denaturation. Okay, um, so it's all about the lysis. Now, in terms of lysis, you have your bacterial cell. Now it has its holes in its peptidoglycan, which then goes off to a new kind of cell, basically just pops open. And at this point, all your DNA is able to just leave. Okay, and that's how we extract the DNA. Um, we use proteinase K in, in this step because not only is there DNA within the um, cell, there's a whole bunch of proteins. And it's these proteins that we're really trying to do. So your, your pro K denatures all of these proteins, and that's really very important. Um, so now you have your, sorry, uh, this step should be done somewhere between 37 degrees C and 65 degrees C. Proteinase K is a very robust protein. It will cope with high levels of SDS and high temperatures at the same time. Its activity will even increase at, in these conditions. Unfortunately, um, it doesn't last very long at these temperatures and as you increase temperature you also increase the amount of polysaccharides and other inhibitors that are coming out. So at this step it's a compromise of active proteinase K and um, good lysis. So it's something to bear in mind when you're designing your protocol. Next is centrifugation steps. So basically you just spin. Um, and normally you will spin your samples down uh, three times. So the first spin will be about um, 4,000 to 10,000 degrees, uh, sorry, 4,000 to 10,000 Gs at about four degrees Celsius. Um, the reason you use four degrees Celsius is because at higher temperatures, the polysaccharides aren't quite solid yet. They never, they never become quite solid, but um, they're much more solid at 4 degrees than they are at, um, say, room temperature. So you have your tube. And your tube has a conical at the bottom. Now what you'll first see is your cell debris. This stuff at the bottom is basically the sponge or the bacterial material that um, has run out. Next 
you will see a layer of aqueous material, uh, usually the colour of the sponge sample. And on top of that, you will see a layer. Now this is your polysaccharides. Um, you want to remove only the pink layer, so this is your polysaccharides. This is your cell debris. And this here is your DNA. So you take your DNA out and into a fresh tube. Now, once you've done that, again spinning at somewhere between 4000 and 10,000 G, you end up with your tube. Now in this case, you'll have a tiny cell pellet. Virtually, hopefully, nothing at all. But even though you will have only taken the um, only taken out the DNA solution, so that's the lysis buffer, you'll still end up with a layer of polysaccharide. Now if you're lucky, it will only be along one side. Um, but if you're not lucky and you have lots of polysaccharide in your sample, then you end up having quite a lot more. So again, taking only your DNA into a third spin. Now this time, you end up with a much cleaner tube. So you should have no cell pellet this time, and only a fraction of your sample should have um, the polysaccharide left. Um, so you end up with what is relatively clear. At this point, your solution should be clear liquid. Um, it may have a slight colour to it, but it should be clear. When I normally do this, it's pink, um, which is why I'm using the pink pen. So now you have this, and you want to do your cleanup. Okay. So your cleanup basically involves a chemical called PCI. So that is phenol, chloroform, isoamyl alcohol. Um, so your PCI basically is taking out all of the fat soluble uh, material and proteins. Um, any protein that is left, it basically is denatured by this and ends up in a layer. So you have your tube, um, you, so you add one volume. Always one volume, never less. Um, and you do several of these um, repeats. So first of all, you have now have your tube. Okay. So you have put your PCI in, and we'll give that this color. Okay, so you have your PCI at the bottom. Now when you put it in, it's a clear liquid, but often it will um, take on some of the color from the aqueous phase. Um, now, having started out pink, you'll end up being quite clear or potentially another colour. Um, if you're very unlucky with polysaccharides, it'll go cloudy and you'll need to do even more PCI steps. But in addition to the um, aqueous phase, the organic phase, you'll have a protein phase. And it's this protein in the middle that you want to avoid. So this is your organic, your protein, and your aqueous phases. Okay, now you only take the aqueous phase over. So this is the one with the DNA. Now in your second spin, it should end up being nice and... your aqueous phase should end up being nice and clear. So, just draw that in. Um, you will end up with a tiny 
tiny uh, layer of um, protein and your organic phase should have also changed colour to a slightly, uh, also quite clear um, if, it, if all has gone well. Um, if not, just do a third PCI and you'll be fine. Next, you want to precipitate. Okay, so. So you want to precipitate your DNA. Uh, now there are several ways of doing this, um, but because we have such a high salt concentration, we get to be able to use um, isopropanol or propan-2-ol. Um, this basically is a slightly nicer way of precipitating your DNA at high salt concentrations. So you have your tube, And as soon as you add your um, isopropanol, um, then you will see strands of DNA forming. So these strands will look like this. You know, they will be everywhere. So this is your DNA. Once you start to see this, it usually takes about 30, um, 30 min at about 22 degrees Celsius. Um, the reason you do it at room temperature is because at lower temperatures the salt will start to precipitate as well. Um, so you always precipitate with 0.7 volumes. Okay, um, and this DNA can now get either pulled onto a glass rod or spun down. Um, normally at around about 10,000 G for 30 minutes at uh, 22 degrees C. Okay, and this is how you end up getting all of your DNA out of a sample.